I hope everyone enjoyed the party last night. Yeah. Not too much. You still have a whole day of training. <laughs> um, so I have the honor of presenting this year's Design Summit keynote speakers, Antoine Predock. And accompanying him is Paul Feilau, um, who is the executive senior associate uh, at the office of Antoine Predock Architect. He's been working with Antoine for over 25 years and has actually been using Vectorworks that whole time. So a little bit about Antoine. He is the professor of practice at the School of Architecture at the University of New Mexico. Um, he's also a frequent lecturer at universities around the world, most recently in China. Uh, his firm has designed and planned over 200 buildings and projects, uh, including the Austin City Hall, the San Diego Padres Park, uh, the Canadian Museum of Human Rights, which is also featured on a Canadian postage stamp, and the soon-to-be-released Canadian $10 bill. Um, the firm's work has also been featured in more than 60 exhibits over, I mean, there's so many things going on here, 250 books, over 1,000 journal and newspaper articles, as well as movies, such as Gattaca. Antoine has been honored with hundreds of national and regional awards, uh, including the AIA Gold Medal in 2006 and the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt Design Museum Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, Antoine is also a fellow of the AIA, RIVA, and RAIC. He was also a Rome Prize Fellow at the American Academy in Rome. So all of these achievements uh, are, are pretty, pretty lofty. And uh, um, I just wanted to, to add that I think that Antoine is a very respected and loved individual, not just because of these professional achievements and artistic achievements, but uh, also because of his presence and his humanity. Uh, when I met him last night, he actually spoke to me in Arabic, which really blew me away, so that was pretty awesome. Um, but this uh, presence and this humanity really manifests itself in his designs and his philosophy of site specificity. And uh, he's been an inspiration for a lot of my own work, as well as for students and designers around the world. So please help me in welcoming Antoine and Paul. <clears throat> so is BibLab here? Yes. Hey, BibLab. Thank you for inviting me, man. I'm a walking Vectorworks commercial. I'm not going to let you down on that end, OK? So the title of my lecture is pretty like an academic, long-winded sounding title. All it means is, hey, pay attention to where you're working, OK? And that can be, OK, like, that applies to lots of things. Like, for example, what would Breaking Bad be without Albuquerque, New Mexico? It's a character, right? Just like Walt, just like Jesse like everybody. So, and I know that you're overweighted here with uh, entertainment people. Let's just see how many architects. I want to get to figure this out. Yeah, well, you're a minority. <laughs> How's it feel? Um, so anyway, um, well, how I'm going to talk about it is uh, applicable for about anything. And if, it, if I'm, I'll correct course along the way, if I think I'm leaning, going too far toward too far toward architecture, and I'll come back, I'll reel it back into uh, whatever entertainment is. I don't know what that means even. I don't even know what you do. Um, <laughs> use vector works, right? I mean, you, you got a deal. So, okay. Can you turn that light out right there? Lighting dude I talked to earlier? Try, try to do that. Um, so, how do you define a place where you're working in a context of globalization where I love my Apple Watch, I love all this stuff. I, we live in that soup of globalization. I love Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. But when, you, when I work in a, in a particular place, 
I want to really try to understand it. So I, I chose a highway road cut as symbolic of that. That's Sidling Hill in Maryland. We do, in New, I'm from New Mexico for like 60 years. We don't have a road cut that can compete with that one. This is the most badass road cut known to man. Sidling Hill, Maryland. So in that road cut, there's Precambrian granite way at the bottom. Really deep, deep time. And then sedimentary strata, the Jurassic, Pennsylvania, limestone epoch probably there. On up through sandstone layers and strata. Finally, cultural intervention, a film, like a few millimeters on a meter stick on top of the road cut. That's, that should be humbling to an architect, right? Shouldn't we be paying a lot of attention to like the deepest, deepest connection to site? Now, the, the film of cultural intervention starts with native people and, you know, what you know, we've done to them. And thank God for casinos and some loot finally going their way. Um, but <clears throat> so then, then that road cut, there's the historical layers, you can imagine, up to McDonald's wrappers blowing around and space, what's beyond. So I pay, try to pay attention to all of that. In New Mexico, it's easy to do that because it's in your face all the time. I mean, the uh, globalization aspect would be the crossroads of those contrails. Now, over Albuquerque, which is a big navigation hub, I guess, because everybody targets it. And um, all the airlines converge there at one point. So there's that in my face. But then the Sandia Mountain Range also, right there. I live right on the edge of the Rio Grande, looking toward the Sandia Mountains. In Breaking Bad, you will have seen them appear many times. Um, and then the, the ancient culture, the Acoma Pueblo, the Pueblo Benito at Chaco Canyon in the slide on the right. Hey, Paul, laser, how about laser pointing some stuff, dude? Don't fall asleep. This is Paul Falau. Paul, stand up, because this is like, you could be, he could be teaching a session here, I'm saying, um, in Vectorworks. You're a vet, man, 25 years of it. Um, I'm going to refer to that later with you. Okay. So um, that's the foreground for what I'm going to talk about, the road cut. The, sp the particularities of place. How do I get there? How do you figure it out? How do I interpret it? So there, there's all this cultural detritus that goes along with any place. And where you go is to airport. These are all from airport postcard racks, all these images that define places, you know, in different ways. And the, the Wild West, that Bermuda Triangle, where I've been working for a long time between Phoenix, Las Vegas, and Albuquerque, you see, you see all that stuff. I mean, you can easily imagine Thunderdome happening there. Easy, easy to picture that. So that's part of the mix. But then I've got to work globally. Our team has to work globally. So that's where we work and, and visit and draw. Some of these are just like scuba diving trips where I'm drawing things all, all, along the way. The uh, scuba diving relates to cultural location because like if we're doing a, doing a um, project in Hong Kong or China, then the Maldives are pretty close by. Go to the Maldives from here, like a big deal, but not from Hong Kong. So it, that gets worked in. And so the, the life, the adventure story of being an architect is alive and well when you, get, when you do stuff like that. And you should always sneak stuff in like that when you have trips. You know, your bosses won't always know that. Piplop would, wouldn't, get, wouldn't worry about that, probably, if you did that, if you sneak a trip in. Um, so these are locations. And then, uh, so there's an A380 and containers and all this stuff, all this stuff, you know, floating around. And that helps site specificity because it, goes, it gives you implementation, gives you mobility to study different places. And it gives you the, the tools, you know, the stuff like Vectorworks and uh, other tools to do stuff. And then amidst all of this, it's really important. <clears throat> How many students here? Anybody? Students. Which you give freebie students passes, don't you? Okay, there's, there's a few. Go ASU, probably, I don't know. Um, so students. Oh, you, everybody, 
physical and digital, duh. You make things with your hands, you draw, you make stuff, and then you deploy anything you can to pull it off. So that's our new bumper sticker we're using now. I hit it up there. So traveling around and soaking places up is one way to be site specific. And that on a Lambretta, I traveled from Air Paris to Istanbul as a student in the 60s. And I, I went to UNM, then went to Columbia, got a fellowship from Columbia to do that. So there I am on the way to Istanbul from Paris. And then journals, student journals, we all had some version of that. Really important to uh, keep that going all your life, I think, in whatever form you, it takes. It could be Apple Pen, I mean, it wouldn't matter. So then I graduated to a BMW from the scooter. More travel, more drawing all over the place. Now, every drawing has a deep story I could tell. There, um, you know how personal it is when you, when you make a mark on, on paper, when you do something that's really special and extraordinary when you're translating that, how it sinks in you, in, in your system, into your being. So that's important to do that. So now I ride an electric motorcycle, a Zero FXS and a DSR, and they're faster than my Ducatis. And I have a collection of those. They're way faster. They're nastier. 116 foot-pounds of torque compared to like the high 90s for a D Ducati Diablo, for example. Um, and they're just crazy fast. And I like that. Um, and those drawings are with an Apple pen. So uh, I'm, you know, advancing slowly but surely from ink and oil pastel and rapidographs. If anybody knows what, that, what those things were, those ancient things. It was so nasty to clean out. You had to shake them all the time. So here I am now. That's how I draw. So the, um, the confusion of my career has been that I was married to a dancer. Um, I'm married to Constance de Young now, a, a, a noted sculptor, a really good sculptor. For 20, we've been with together seven, 27 years. Before that, I was married to a dancer. And we co-directed a dance company. Um, at Columbia, she was at Juilliard, danced in the Met, the Met um, Court de Ballet as a soloist. Then became, went into modern. And we um, <clears throat> had a studio. You can see the, um, that all the buildings in our complex in Albuquerque at the corner of 12th and Marquette. Some houses, some old buildings, courtyards between, all link, locking, interlocking, and a dance studio. So my kids grew up in that soup of dance, of uh, architecture, of art in general. So then the translation, so I just wanted to show you that about the, about the kind of interdisciplinary overlap that we're all involved in, it just happens, right? Can't help it. So dance for me, the choreographic imperative in architecture is really strong. It's like ep architecture is about episodic space, episodic intention, episodic movement. It's like a movie director making a storyboard. So how do we make storyboards? Giant collages. When I was in, I started engineering. I should, should have mentioned that. Um, you saw my slide rule up there. Anybody know what that was, the slide rule? Uh, that's, I did quadratic equations on that. And I was a mechanical engineering student for a long time before I felt how empty that whole thing was for me. And we, you know, and, and ran into an architect who I thought was just crazy, crazy mofo and I should do what he's doing. <laughs> and I switched. Um, so when I went to, when I switched, I had all my nasty engineering electives out of the way, all the tech stuff. And I could take art courses and poetry courses on top of all that. And the, um, that was a re revelation to me. It was like the bohemian life, the life of an artist. My, I, one of my, my professor was Elaine de Kooning. She was teaching at UNM. And she's, a, I think, a better painter than Wilm de Kooning myself. So drawers and drawers of sketchbooks, the big collages, you can see how big they are. They're like the width of the screen almost. That's about actual size right there. Um, all over the place, hundreds of them through the years to get ready for projects, to psych up for a project. Now the collages would, would involve 
understanding of ge geologic time, deep time of that particular place would involve um, topicality. What's the place about? Who lives there? Who's famous? What's the deal? And all that, and then quotations and lines from poetry or literature that I thought really evoked the place in a special way, commingling with imagery. And thank you, Google Images. And had, thank you, my Canon. Thanks for our Canon plotter. Um, we could do all that. And then clay models. That's my next step. Hand-built, physical, digital, handmade clay models. I know that seems really strange to um, people that are vastly more sophisticated than I am in terms of the digital realm, the, globaliz the globalized people, but it really feels good to work with clay. You know, car designers do it. I still do it that way. So there's a few of them. And then they be, oops. I'm out of range. Tech meltdown. We, bet we went quickly by a clay model. This thing isn't backing up. To the rescue. Oh, I was pushing. I pushed the wrong button. <laughs> that, wasn't a tel that wasn't a tech meltdown. That was a, that was a dumbass Antoine meltdown. <laughs> Sorry. Not going to happen again. OK, Com complicated project, the size of a size of a little village, the largest student recreation facility in the world, I think it still is, in Ohio State. So clay model, collage, clay model, then bang, giant project, um, starting with a modest little clay model. So then a string of projects. I'm going to focus on a couple of recent, fairly recent competition wins, three of them actually, and then get into um, a bunch of 50-year anniversary of making architecture, 60 years since I started school. So it's a big year for me and for Paul. 25 years of that chunk of time. So this is the competition for the uh, Canadian Museum for Human Rights. There were 63 entries, including the usual suspects, Gary, Zaha, Liebskind, etc. And there were 21 um, countries represented. It was an open competition, which I would never do. It would be like condescending to do an open competition. Why didn't you invite us to do it? You know, like invite a competition. Give us an honorarium. Well, this is a freebie. Wide open competition. It was so sexy and so wonderful sounding, though, that I did it, for sure. It was important to do it. So in, in Winnipeg, the Sweetgrass Prairie, the wings of a dove reminded me of, like, human rights iconography. Drifting snow, the Tyndall limestone of that particular beautiful province of Canada. So the clay model starts out, and I thought of roots. I thought of clutching the earth. So many oppressed cultures are such so deeply earth connected. To honor that, and to, so to clutch the earth, but to bring light down, from, to go from darkness to light vertically in the building. So the very first impressions of uh, what would happen. Now, the, the models are, are very carefully scaled. They're not like, hey, shapes I like to make that look cool. Now, lots of architects do that, famous ones do that, and I think that's evil to do that, to not to know that the program is a reality from the very beginning. So when the clay models are made, my team cuts out blocks to scale of all the different components down to the restrooms, you know, whatever, and they're there in a pile, and I'm assembling those. We're, we're critiquing as a team how they then translate to clay. So they're very accurate models. They're not like, hey, he's just partying with clay and making shapes. That's the last thing I'm doing. That's really, it's really a horrible way to work. Like parametric design can be such a trap, right? Like, look at the cool things you can make. Students do it all the time. They don't have any clue about what the building's made of or anything else, or if it has, even has soul. Parametric pr procedures don't have soul. How do you imbue soul 
into your work through, through digital translations. Well, that's, that's the great challenge. And it, it's like Garcia Lorca, Alma del Lugar, the soul of a place. And that's what I'm talking about, trying to, to persist in doing that, finding out that special place, um, the special qualities of that place. And then bam, uh, BIM stuff. And great, welcome to the process. That shows the cutaway. Pay attention to the ramps that are kind of cut off and truncated here. Um, they're uh, alabaster. You will see them. So a whole flow of model studies, physical and digital, hands-on, fantastic team, trying to figure out how to make the cloud that surrounds the building and stick it on a clay model. Well, we, that, that was a failure right there, obviously. But uh, it evolved into lots of studies about the, the nature of the cloud that wraps the building. And then um, <clears throat> Z-Core, Z-Core Rapid Prototyper, making things, lots of different things we, along our way that we, we made. We study details at big scale using Z-Core and also the guts of the building. Huge team effort on a project of this scale. The mother and its babies. <laughs> all different scales of models, always. I like to get my head in a model so I can spatially sense it. You know, I've got it in my head, or it wouldn't have happened, but I mean to feel it. The competition winning model. Garden of Contemplation at the core. Tower of Hope. All kinds of sustainable. Well, here's the thing. Here's like a, a, you got a quickie rant I've got to do about sustainability. Don't fetishize it. You don't have to do that. If you're a really good architect, designer in any field, of course you do that. You think about resources and you think about site. Hey, where's the wind direction? Where's the sun direction? How's the change seasonally? All that. Of course you do that. Don't make it a subject. Like I go to a student review and then they start talking about sustainability instead of their mission about this, that their life brought into this focus on this project and what that means at that moment in time. I get tired of that. So the, the, that rant is over, I won't do it anymore. That's the studio. That's a 1929 Indian, 101 scout back there. Queenie liked it. She saw the model. She brought a stone from Runnymede to become part of the, um, like a cornerstone of the building. I think she liked it because it reminded her of her hats. <laughs> <laughs> and then we built it. And over a long period of time, 10 years of my life, chunk of my life, A stone mountain wrapped by a cloud. A stone mountain that clutches the earth. A winter aspect. Down the Red River aspect. It's at the confluence of the Assiniboine and the Red River in Winnipeg. It's the first national museum out of Ottawa that they've ever built. Kind of proud of that. the roots, now the chunks, the stone chunks, the, the mountain, those are galleries. And then the stone, then the uh, cloud, the glazed cloud wraps the garden of contemplation. So as you're going, experiencing the galleries, there's some heavy information there that you can imagine in a human rights, human rights museum. And there's a respite from that in the garden of contemplation that I showed in one of the competition renderings. It's a multiple personality building. It's kind of a benign disorder.
into the entry to the darker part of the building compared to above the Great Hall, which is a major event location. Just to review, that's of course in the uh, between the roots down below, going in the entry, and then there's the ascent up through the ramps. Paul, point out the ramps on that. Oh, here it is. I got it. Yeah. And um, this is the event space in action. Museums always have to have subsidies of all sorts to keep, you know, keep it going. This has the, the state, the federal government behind it, so it's pretty well endowed, but you're still looking for fundraising raising opportunities, so you can do corporate events, all kinds of things, weddings in these spaces. So up through the building, fissures of light carving down through to the space below, the great central space. An important thing was to have the, uh, the worker bees on display, working on globally on, inter on uh, human rights issues in real time that the visitor of the museum can see. They're not tucked away in a wing or a basement. They're right there in your face. All from a little tiny clay model. Up the ramps, the very, that's the beginning of the progression. Now these ramps form a kind of labyrinth, I call it the alabaster labyrinth, <clears throat> and they pass through the different galleries. So they're zooming through the galleries, you're looking up and down at the ramps, other people, you're looking at the sky above through skylight. They're alabaster from Aragon in Spain. I went to the quarries and picked the particular alabaster that seemed right, and then somehow we afforded it. You know, there was a lot of, a lot of fed pressure on the budget on this, for this one for sure, as you can imagine. But we pulled this off. It took a very dedicated woman, Gail Asper, to go to the quarries herself and cut a special deal on the price. Glowing alabaster. You know, it's an ancient material, and that, that evocation of ancient time in this building that was important. Not only the Tyndall limestone of Manitoba that is dominantly constructed of, but also the the, uh, the sense of alabaster as like, like a, an ancient container for unguents in biblical times. Very special material, very, very iconic material. You know, VE came along and they wanted to change it to obscure glass. You gotta fight back. You know that, right? Don't ever give up, ever. Just be a bastard, whatever it takes. So many different kinds of exhibits. I, I don't have time to go through all of those, but lots of hands-on stuff along the way. Finally to the top, express elevators to the Tower of Hope, and also the, the long route. It's about a kilometer long, actually, all the, all the ramps and the, the journey through the building. Garden of Contemplation. Garden of Contemplation is water bodies, small, delicate water bodies, medicinal plants to be added in consultation with native elders from the area, from the First Nations tribes that surround uh, the site in Manitoba. Panorama on top. That's where the geese start out. They come down here, up here. Winter mist. Postage stamp, national postage stamp, yay. Even bigger yay, $10 bill. I've got a copy of one I can show you, but the real thing is coming out November 19th out of the, out of the Mint. I'm going to a special event in Winnipeg for that. So, why don't we just end it right there? <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm gonna, I got a lot more architecture coming for you. Okay, so China, at the exact same time that 
we decided to compete for the Museum of Human Rights, this really fantastic project came up in, in, tai, in Taiwan. And it was the um, National Palace Museum. Now, Chiang Kai-shek ripped off the Forbidden City when he, when he left China to take the, the Chinese Republic to what was then Formosa, later Taiwan. And so all those treasures are there. I've got a special collection that deals with influences of the Silk Road commerce and the sea routes, of course, too, that connected China to Europe in those times, in the time of the Tang Dynasty, 12th century, um, such an active route. So I thought to really, uh, so 40 finalists in 14 countries, the same usual suspects competing against them. So I thought, shouldn't I know about the Silk Road if I'm going to do this? Should I know what, how that worked? I mean, what, the, what influenced those, the, the, the kind of multicultural influence on Chinese art coming from the West in that, in that sense? So I went out to the Silk Road and uh, did all these drawings and the Turofan Oasis near Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan to Urumqi to Dunhuang to the Mogao Caves and then started a model for the competition. And then it became that model. And so in, in Chinese culture, there's no word for landscape. The word is san shui, mountain water. And those, that's the obsessive thing you see in Chinese scroll paintings. That's a, that's a um, Song Dynasty, 13th century scroll painting there. And uh, I thought mountain water, that obsession with mountain. And then, so the building had to deliver on that, kind of a mountain in the water. So that's many, many other cultural nuances are involved when we make the collages and really study a place. Really important layers of information that are they're very fine detailed to a very broadly, broad scope of, uh, hey, where's the wind direction, where's the sun, all that. But deeper understanding, so I'm kind of breezing through all that, but it's a big deal. I have a library this wide of uh, studies of Chinese art, the places where we were, were the, on the Silk Road and the, and the uh, and Taiwanese culture also. So in Taiwanese culture, on the, on the Harvest Moon Day celebration, which is in, in this shot, it's, um, they do barbecue on the streets in Taipei. Paul knows because Paul lived in Taipei a couple of years while this project was going on. He was the guy there. And so, um, and so it was Vetterworks. They were there too, right? You took them with you. So I think when, I, when we make images, I hate to call them renderings because for me, they're informational digital collages. They talk about, in this case, a cultural event, the barbecuing going on and the lanterns lining the causeway leading into the building, all these things that, were, that are deeply traditional for the e place that uh, augment the other messages of the building. So I, so I maybe just don't say rendering anymore. Talk them, say, think of it like you're dig digitally collaging ideas. I know you do that anyway. There's nothing new. But it's, it's important to, for me to preach about that. complex circulation. You know the red ribbon dance at the Olympics? I thought about the red ribbon dance, these rampways that provide alternative routes to the galleries. And the, the themes of the galleries vary. And those are my drawings from the sea routes and from the Silk Road arrayed around the galleries that would inspire aspects of their installations. the Buddhist gallery. In the 17th century, um, there's a lot of pollution that came from the West into China. Perspective was one thing. The, the wonderful naivete, so-called naivete, it's not naive, of the Chinese scrolls that had no perspectival controls, just episodic, incidental kinds of assemblages of activities are so powerful. And that's a way to think about making architecture or anything. 
to incrementally, episodically make a story that evolves and without any kind of overall master control, master, master uh, plan for it, like perspective would generate. So in this, in this gallery, that's a 17th century gallery, which talks about the art when that happened, when that, I just call it pollution, came from the West. And so I'm part of the pollution because I'm an architect, a gringo, ar gringo architect working there. And so was Quentin Tarantino, obviously. He was a gringo pre-co-opting manga and all kinds of stuff to make. Uh, but then that scene when she came out of the, the, the carnage of the cafe into the snowy courtyard and wasted Lucy Liu with one stroke, that's one of the most powerful things. And I think in movies all the time in my work, I mean, threshold events like that, how powerful is that? Incredible. I, I don't know if you agree with that. Not heads. No, they don't agree. <laughs> A lot of sustainable stuff here I could rant and rave about. Deeply, deeply embedded in the work. Right, Paul? Totally embedded. Um, so, regime change. The DPP was the political body, let's just call them Dems, and the KMT, let's just call them the pubs, came along and didn't want to have anything to do, any project that the DPP had instigated. So it got shut down. So that's a sad story. But students, you've got to know this. You do all this work, you think, you know, you busted butt, you, you pulled all nighters. Which lights are on on a campus at night? Which building lights are on? Okay, you know that, right? Not the business school, not the law school, <laughs> for sure. We all know that. So um, if you don't build what you design as a, as a student or as an architect, it's in your spiritual savings account. That's some rationalization maybe, but and mine is chock full of stuff that didn't happen, okay? But the energy that went into making it, of course it's still there. It didn't, doesn't vanish. It's like the soul doesn't just go away when you die, I don't think. It's still doing something, it's still got a job to do. So anyway, that's, a, that's a, quite a jump, wasn't it? <laughs> Can we all just meditate for a moment? Okay, so Pandaville, Sichuan, province of China, Chengdu, China, research, drawing, studying the area, going to Yunnan, to, to Tibet actually, to the most eastern reg regions of Tibet, which are now China, and trying to be Chinified, but with a lot of resistance. Um, understanding the place, San Shui, in a, in a different way, the clay model of a gateway center for a new town of 100,000 people. In China, you can say, hey, let's do a new town for 100,000 people, and they say in Beijing, they say, okay, get it done. No screwing around, and they're, they're doing it. So this is the gateway building, the arrival building, the welcome center, the expo center, the art center for the, this new town on a lake. So that the foreground is water of that masonite base to my clay model. So drawings along the way, Z-core models. So from clay to Z-core overnight, that's the great thing. We didn't have Katya or any kind of fancy um, scaling software, so we just measured the models with a, with, a, with a ruler, with an architect scale. We just measure them, convert them to a digital model, and, and go from there. And the, what I do, and Paul knows about this, is we come, come, I say, hey, compare that to the clay model. Show me an overlay of the, uh, of the digital model. I want to see if you're, if you're messing with it. And you didn't mess with it, usually. I mean, you, didn't, you couldn't get away with it, for one thing. <laughs> and, and why would he want to mess with it? Another example of digital collaging. There's a fire island that floats around. Those are, those are modules that are against the shore that are kind of glowing over here on the right. My laser pointer quit. Over there, Paul. Yeah. And those are perfect 16-foot cubes that detach from the shoreline. They're all lined up and float out so you can have your dinner, 
phoning and you get your, your service, 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 service staff goes on with you and you get catered out in the lake. In architecture, it's important just to make stuff up all the way along. Make stuff up. And sometimes you think, how, how can I possibly get away with that? But a lot of times you get away with it. So make stuff up that you like, that you fantasize about, that you dream about. And don't worry about, oh, is the client going to like that? You know, you just lay it on them. They, that's what they're paying big bucks for. It's not for, uh, you know, being timid. So in any field, in entertainment, of course you've got to kick butt, right? Just do anything. That's what it's all about. I mean, that's the bottom line. Architecture is more, much more timid about it. Timid. So there's, the, there's Google Earth. Okay, there's the welcome center, that fractured piece. There's a theater over here. Paul to the rescue with the laser pointer. Yeah, there you go. Theater, welcome center, really cool integrated parking carved into the earth for VIP parking only, I guess. Um, marina, little bay, green roofs everywhere. Cafe Tower. You were just there, your recent shots. Just finishing this phase with a new phase starting up that we're going to get to do. The color of the earth of Sichuan, matching the, those, that's bush, bush hammered concrete, precast concrete, and also cast in place combination. Matching the color of the soil of uh, even the paving of Sichuan. You know, Sichuan food's really good. Sichuan, but Sichuan actually is really good. You know that, right? <laughs> Try to opt for that whenever you chance you get. The roofscape. Oops. So there's the Tower Cafe. It's, it's lined with red spandrelite glass. That means integrally colored red glass. And the windows are red. And so the whole thing is like a glowing core of a volcano. That's my interior design concept. And reflection where you don't expect it. Like the soffits are pol highly polished stainless steel. And the overhang detail is a knife edge. There's no fascia board, none of that stuff. It's a knife edge. I think it's important to mess with perception. Any chance you get, like those, the uh, distortions of those polished mirror, mirror, mirror uh, stainless steel overhangs. Mess with perception. Alter perception. That's what you get paid for. Messing with people. Not in, a, not in an evil way, though. I mean, you could do it. You can make arca torture easy. <laughs> I mean, I've got a couple of projects that are definitely arca torture. I'm not saying what they, who they are, where they are. But uh, I've got my portfolio of arca torture. You don't want to do that, though, to people. It's not good for them. So don't do that. And the entertainment also. Don't do evil entertainment. Do spiritually uplifting entertainment. Make that on your, you know, your list of uh, stuff you need to do and this, inter this entertainment, whatever, the, whatever you do. I don't know what you do. Mo mo what do you do? Movies? How many of you are in movies? Oh, I know. Um, exhibit design. I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> That's not going anywhere. So, Qatar. You've got to pronounce it. Qatar. Instead, it's not Qatar. Qatar, it's not Qatar, it's Qatar. I got very heavily scolded for, for being a gringo mispronouncing Qatar lots of times. So the dune formations, the saif, the, the Arabic knife, the scimitar, the hilal, the uh, Ramadan moon, the very beginning of the new moon, 
all these shapes in uh, Islamic calligraphy. It's for a project in uh, Doha, Qatar. Qatar. So I had to think about all my desert experience all around, traveling and soaking that up. And here I am working in the desert. That's pretty good because not too many projects are in the desert like that. They're like temperate zones, different parts of the world. But um, I got to party in the desert like I'm born to do. Clay model. You see all the bits and pieces, all of the scale shapes that define the program that have been assembled along with the clay to make sure it's working with somebody really policing me on it, somebody on the team who really knows the program and not letting me get away with anything, like just shape making. I like shape making, I'm, that's what I'm doing, but it's like rational, it's, it's real. So the idea is make a fortress, a really gnarly perimeter condition, heavy textured stone protecting an inner lining you know, the old shell lining cliche of the seashell is rough and then the lining is very po polished. That is what I want to do. z core to the rescue. Quick look at functions. This is the Northwestern University College of Journalism and Communication in Qatar. They, they have, at that education city that was established and invented by Sheikh Moza, basically the queen of Qatar, um, to bring international students together with Middle Eastern students from Cornell, from Texas A&M, from Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie, Mellon, Carnegie Mellon, and others, Northwestern, and uh, create this mix in the Middle East of uh, cultural exchange so the different model stages, physical, digital. So the, you're wondering what the cantilever thing is. That, it's media mesh. So it, it's, um, the building has a really great, great dean. His name is Ev, and he's the DJ for the building. And he, he like DJs real time events in the building and shoots them to the big screen. So the whole campus can see it and the world at large can see it for what that's worth. It's like to show, to show the animation of a building. It's all about communication and media as well as journalism and books and newspapers. So um, all kinds of things are up here on that. That just happened to be the opening celebration one they put up. So the stone fortress, when we made a control sample like we do in architecture to test the, uh, how, the, how the, the wall would appear and how it would be built, it looked way too timid. So I said, lay the stone like you made a mistake, like you really messed up. And that's what we got. And that's exactly what I wanted. It would, either, if it would have been too timid and too tight, I think Canada stone's too tight, too timid. And I tried and tried and tried, but that just, so I, I took it out on Qatar and I, got, I really got it here. So the inner lining, these are, these are um, screen grabs out of a video of the actual courtyards, the green roofs, this garden within. You know, think Alhambra or think so many precedents in, in Islam for fantastic sequestered spaces. Notice these buildings are all different looking, right? They're not, maybe there's an Antoine firm ID on them. I don't know if there is or not, but um, they're really different. And I'm really proud of that. Get a giant media wall in the forum section of the building. Core 10, wood, 
by the way, I think a journalism school should smell like books. So we made sure that the, the smell of books came wafting down to the public spaces out of the, the stacks. But it's really way more than books now, obviously. Different events, they have a, they have a newsroom simulation that major conferences there, the, the Qatar conferences there, the Al Jazeera has a branch here. So the heaviness and the lightness, the dance of light in the desert, so that's a powder coated steel trellis, welded steel trellis. It changes all the time. Working with light, that's a subject for architects. It's like a thing, capital T for sure. And uh, it's just kind of second nature. Hey, you know, filter light in the desert, explosive light in Canada that comes right in and drenches it in the winter. So now I'm gonna just blast through 50 years of architecture. You thought that that was kind of maybe the end I'm wrapping up, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, Biplab. I'm. I appreciate uh, your patience. You haven't fallen asleep yet. No, not yet. <laughs> if you put the CEO of a company to sleep and you're an architect, that's you're really in trouble. So I'm watching you. <laughs> so my first project, Adobe, real Adobe, in, our, in called Alus in Albuquerque. I'm not going to talk much more about them. And then the first comp first thing out of New Mexico, where I, I became no longer Mr. Adobe, but he came on the road to doing things outside New Mexico. I won a competition at Arizona State University right here over in Tempe. Go check it out. Light figures in there, obviously. Wyoming, the American, American Heritage Center. I'm including a, like a handmade thing with all these shots just to, just to rub that in about physical and digital. I really mean that. That's my handmade thing there. Las Vegas. Oh, this is a Sheraton, right? A Sheraton Resort. So Sheraton Resort, is this the best you can do? This was a Sheraton for Las Vegas. And it freaked them out so badly. I trucked the model all the way to New York to present to the, to the CEO of Sheraton and made a great presentation. And uh, it's just, they, after they told me, pull all the stops, Antoine, it's Vegas, man. Go for it, which I did, right? <laughs> In Italian, as they say, porca miseria, the misery of a pig. So to get, to get at, so that's Atlantis, by the way. That's, I imagine Atlantis through, through, through some crazy um, tectonic event crept over and erupted in Las Vegas from there north of the Basque Country, wherever it is now. And that happened. And so it erupted out. So there's the Atlantean Plateau. And I didn't know how to make an Atlantean Plateau because Atlanteans are beyond my comprehension. They're in another space-time um, universe. So I broke glass on the floor of our studio and uh, I liked the shapes of the break, and then the shapes of the break defined the Atlantean Plateau. So that's how I do landscape architecture. I'm a licensed landscape architect, and that's what I do. Um, and then we use the shards from the glass to make a little tiny model out of glass shards, that glowing one up there in the corner, besides that big model. So did Sheraton chicken out? They did, didn't they, right? What do you do when a client chickens out? First you say, okay, you're mad and you're really pissed off for a couple weeks and you complain and all that. And then you say, oh, it's in my spiritual savings account, so it does matter, it does matter. You're still mad, so it doesn't matter all that much, but, <laughs> but you, that finally diminishes and you go to a shrink and it helps. <laughs> University of Wyoming, the Rose House in Dallas, the, the Turtle Creek House. The the I call it the Theater of the Trees. Bird watchers, and they do major fundraising events, partying, 
big parties like the thing we had last night could be out kind of in this house, out in all of the uh, precinct around the house. It's got a party bridge that zooms into the trees. So I call that a dam of expectation where you, you don't know what's behind it. Now, somebody like a Texan driving down that street would say, what the hell is that? <laughs> and because they don't know what that is. Is that a condo or a library? Library, what is that? Um, but uh, then you break through it and you explode into the Turtle Creek, into the trees, like that. Sky Bridge and Venice Beach. It's got such a long story for such a tiny little project. But this is where you can talk about apertures. So don't, architects, don't say windows anymore. Say aperture. If you say aperture, then that means you're in command of something. It's not just a window, you know, duh, window. And so there's an aperture that is a three quarter of an inch wide glass turned on edge. If you put your right eye against it, you can see the beach, you can see the ocean, and you can see Asia beyond, or you can imagine Asia beyond. That's why the pivot window is red, color of the Japanese flag. Here in Phoenix, the Arizona Science Center, which has been drastically messed with by my, I don't know, I wouldn't say my client, because I don't know who, and you know who does it anymore. You've got to let go of stuff, though, as an architect. And in your work in entertainment, you have, to let, you have to do it, let go, right? Figure out how to do that. Because it can be heartbreaking what people do with messing with your stuff. I mean, if you go to it, you might like it. It's probably OK. But there'll be things that you know, I know is there, or you wouldn't know is there if it was your work, that just drive you up the wall. This one has an aperture to the sky. Sometimes it's Southwest Airlines going by. Sometimes it's a buzzard or clouds. This was a breakthrough project for us in the, in the digital realm. We, we were in the digital realm since the late 80s. But Paul, talk about this, because I, I don't know how to talk about it the way you do. So this, this was the project that uh, made us go from, we, we, we were using three different kinds of CAD software. And the CAD software that a client would get depended on which project manager was working on the project. Uh, but this project, we were trying to draw with a, uh, we had an archaic 3D modeling program, which we had figured out how to make this form, and especially this form right here that you can see on the side, the stealth lobby. Um, and uh, this has some very heavy steel that's coming together precisely in a pattern. And we had figured out how to draw that with through a very archaic 3D modeling software, and we were bringing it into our various different pieces of CAD software. It was very lame. And what it would do is when it would, you know, when you're trying to, our, our work is about precise angles coming together. And none of the other software, except for Minicab, the precursor to Vectorworks, could actually make these points come together here, 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 and here. And it, I we probably don't remember how hard it was to tell a contractor in space at the time where that point is. And, and actually, the old guys could draw that point and uh, on a piece of paper with a pencil, but none of the software could define that except for Minicad, and that's why we eventually, uh, actually because of this project, ended up adopting Minicad and sticking with it until it became Vectorworks until today. So I wanted to look like a, a stealth fighter had crashed into a big white limestone wall, limestone wall. and uh, the limestone honors Sierra Blanca, White Mountain of the, of the uh, Mescalero Nation. It honors that. It's not kind of adobe colored like it could have been. Um, and then the stealth crashed into the side of it. So uh, uh, I'll just pause on this a little bit more. When you go to the theater, like when you go to Broadway, in the old theaters on the, in the 40s. Sometimes there's a giant chandelier that kind of defines the, uh, the, power, of the in, power of entry into the lobby, into the, the event of going to the theater. So I wanted to explode a chandelier and make a 1,000 LEDs that just blast all around it. So the whole thing is like you're inside a chandelier. That was the idea. 
I guess that would be entertainment architecture. Oh, and this is so important. In my, in my day, in our charrettes, in our all-nighters we were pulling, um, to stay up <clears throat> and to stay cooking, I would listen to Dave Brubeck. And uh, Dave Brubeck opened the theater, along with Nadja Salerno Sonnenberg, the, the, the master violinist. And uh, he signed my album cover, my dog-eared vinyl from my student days. I dredged that up and he signed it for me. That was a big deal in my life, along with a $10 bill. <laughs> the Gateway Building for the University of Minnesota. Collaboration with my wife, the sculptors Constance Young. Constance did this gigantic block long quartet piece. She did that and the building picks up from that and does that. That's the arrival point for visitors to the campus and for alumni, etc. Padres Ballpark. God, I hate nostalgic ballparks. Makes me want to puke. You know, like starting with Camden Yards and all like recent ones. I can't stand that. Um, no offense, because I know your your Orioles fans. I mean, no offense to you as a team, but come on, it's the best you can do. So in San Diego, I wanted to make a, to make a garden, pull the co concession, huh? Ten minutes left. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> no, <laughs> really, ten minutes? I can do that. All right. So anyway, the, the concourse is open to the sky. Everything's pulled away like concessions and and uh, club lounges for the expensive t seats and all that. And you bridge across, hanging vines all over the place. You walk through there, Rolling, Stern, Rolling Stones concert. There's, there's Mick right there. Lush, fantastic landscape by Andy Spurlock, landscape architect consultant. It's a garden. Austin City Hall. There's a photo, that's a photovoltaic trellis. Pipe in the back to the building, as well as shading. Central space, which blasts out like that. Now that's the, talk about getting away with stuff. That's over like a public right of way. But hey, it's a city hall. Who gets to call that shot? Lucked out on the right client for that. <laughs> you can see my in my drawing that the, it's a consequence. Paul, this thing isn't working, so a point of my drawing. Follow that, uh, that, that the line of the, the lobby. So it's a, it's a converging perspective, like Borromini did at uh, Plato Spada in Rome, you know, where it seems like infinite perspectival, perspectival depth. Well, I'm a fan of Borromini. Hate Bernini, love Borromini. Um, and it blasts out to become that thing. And there are lots of names for it. So I joked one time, oh, that's a, hey, that's an armadillo tail, <laughs> dumbass, don't you know that? And it kind of stuck, and they're saying, they call it that now. I, you got to be careful when you're joking around. This is Tampa, Museum of Science and Industry. This was a big deal where we, you know, who's old enough to have done checked shop drawings and stamped shop drawings. Raise your hand. Okay, wasn't that a pain in the butt? Okay, this was, I mean, totally awful. Anticlimactic. Um, but that's how the building was gonna look, so you had to be careful about it. So in this one, we didn't have any shop drawings. We did it digitally. This was in, when was that? Mid, mid 90s? Late 90s? Early 90s. Oh, early 90s, okay. Early 90s in Tampa. So, uh, and with, with Bill Zayner in Kansas City, you know, the, the metal guru of all metal gurus. Bill was incredible on this project. 10 minutes, okay, here we go. School of Architecture, UNM, a giant wall. I thought of Kenya Deshaies, you wouldn't know about that. Kenya Deshaies, the, the, this 
big, fantastic wall, a wall for wall's sake, and then lots of cross-pollination, visual, visual eavesdropping in the building. You can always see what's going on in, in studios and critiques, anywhere you are. This is Log Jam House in Colorado. I pictured a, a clearing where we had for the site, for the house, and where there, there were ponderosa pines surrounding it. And I thought, I said to the three-year-old of, of my clients, hey, Franny, what if the logs all fell down and became the house? And she said something like, oh, cool, something like that. And so we, we did that. And we didn't cut any trees down. We found deadfall. It's a 20-acre site. And we collected the deadfall to become Log Jam House. Now, it, the logs shish kebab the house. They go inside. They're quasi-structural, but they're uh, that. Oh, this is a big, that's a really, that's like a cheap house. It really is. This is a really expensive house. 22 mil in Aspen. Clay model down the corner. The montage of the model in the, in the landscape. Titanium, stone, beautiful polished concrete. Once in a while, you get a budget. You know, like, <laughs> I poor bought it in New Mexico for so long. The cheapo budgets. I got used to that. I thought, okay, that's, I like, no more Mr. Adobe, I'm Mr. Drywall now. And, and uh, I kind of learned to live with that. And then all of a sudden, something like this comes along. I didn't squander it. I didn't go, I could have gone crazier, but I didn't do it. I held back. World's sexiest bathroom. That's the Audubon Tri Trinity Center in Dallas. Apertures that zero in on events and landscape in the exhibit areas. Hotel in Shanghai. Maybe, maybe, big, big maybe, if we could get through municipal approval one of these years and go ahead. Wanted to take the, the lake up into the building, like it joined the building as a waterfall, or, the, or I think of it the other way around, waterfall joining the, the, the lake, the mountain beyond, Shan Shui, water mountain, a glass mountain. Those are individual Jungle, jungle rope bridges going to private spas from the top suites of the hotel. My client said, seven star. <laughs> okay. <laughs> who would argue then? No, can't we just do five star? No, I'll take seven. This is in Siberia. This is the freak out the jury. I kind of knew I was doing it when we did it. Sometimes you just have to do that. You know, you can't just do a it's the, it's the World Mammoth and Permafrost Museum in, in Yakutsk, Siberia. Sometimes you just have to uh, don't restrain yourself and just you know do it. The jury were engineers and you know <laughs> just finished this project in Taipei, our first and only tall building, probably ever. I don't know. You're not that. Tall buildings are kind of dumb compared to the stuff like the, the land scrapers we're used to doing. We can really make processional events on a tall building. Okay. Well, I tried. Jade, it's called Jade Cascade. Chunks have fallen down to the, to the, to the uh, ground plane, like talus coming off of a mountain, and then jade glazing and opaque panels and also translucent and clear combinations of glass. Looking down on the street from up on top.
um, just finished this house in Provence. That's the view from the living room. It's in Vaison la Raymond. That's the Roman, that's the uh, medieval cathedral. First drawing on yellow sketch paper. Take note. And then this is the Scorpion House um, out here in Desert Highlands, up against the mountains to the north, before Carefree. And we were just out there yesterday, Paul, through, through these slides. And so the original house was from the 80s. Just did the addition. The, the scorpion's tail. And uh, local thing. A journey from sunrise to sunset is explored in the house. A sun, sunrise terrace and a sunset tower. And the addition zooms out of that. It's a current project on the Peninsula Papagayo in uh, Costa Rica. Para los ticos. That red dot, 12 houses lined up on a ridge. The sales price is, price is 10 mil each, right? Doesn't mean we have a Lux budget to do it, but that's what they're gonna sell them for, no matter what. They'll put the old value of the, the land and everything. So we're in the middle of that right now. And there's Paul, and he's using Vectorworks on that project right now as we speak. Not exactly as we speak, but. And now what happened was my wife and I decided to donate Oh my, it started with, how much time left, Paul? Huh? None. None? <laughs> this, is, this is really the wrap up, we're okay, right? Nobody's, nobody's piling out of here yet. If you fall asleep, I've got whiplash insurance. I'm covered, I'll cover you. Um, so the studios, like I'm an old guy, need a home for my archive when I kick it and where are we going to put it? My wife is over and over again, Antoine, you're going to, this stuff's all going to land on me. What am I going to do with it? Well, I've got different alma mater. So Columbia wanted it. National AIA wanted it. But UNM is my, New Mexico is my spiritual home. I mean, that's it, period. So I gave my archive to UNM, to the Center for Southwest Research. And then we said, OK. And they, they did a real sales job on us. They had like a tax thing throw in the studios themselves and we'll leave it there. We'll leave the models there and we'll teach there. And we'll make it the, that, we'll make it that. And so that's, that came true. And here's the archive. A part of it, the majority of it, of the flat work, flat file stuff is up at UNM and the special collections. So teaching is the thing I do. I'm a professor of practice now at UNM. This is a workshop I did at uh, Casa de la Parte in Capri, Capri. Eat your hearts out. Got to stay in that building. Got to hang out there. I know if you, many of you maybe tried to see it. You can't even get anywhere close except for a telephoto shot. Well, we were there with students living in it, having meals there, and feeling that, that uh, Malaparte vibration. And most recently, a drawing workshop in Guangzhou Paul and I went there and did a lecture and did four different lectures around China and the Chinese architecture students are like students of architecture anywhere. They're just fantastic, so eager, so, so energized, such fun to be around them. And most recently, um, I bust students to vote. I started when early voting started in Mexico the 22nd of, this, of October. And all last week, we're, bu we're busing and walking them to the polls. And their reward was they got a signed drawing. <laughs> they didn't, I didn't tell them how to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. And it's so important. I didn't tell them how to vote. But I think they knew how I was voting, so. So lots of books on the work. Those are monographs from around the world you can find on Amazon. These are recent books. 
AP 50, 50 years of work, is in, in the process. We try to kickstart a shot at it, total failure. <laughs> so can you all just, right now, just fund it? Can you all chip in? Probably like 100 bucks each. Or 100 bucks each. Please. Have a, take my hat when you go by the door. So I want to tell you, if you have any zombie problems, I can help you. Um, that is uh, Norman Reedus, a.k.a. Daryl of The Walking Dead. He knows how to kill zombies. You know who that is, right? No. Daryl? And he's a biker like I am. And that's my Ducati Desmosedici, which he was afraid to ride. This is like a zombie killer, OK? <laughs> it's such a nasty MotoGP bike. But I do ride it. And uh, we went for a ride. And, we, and he, made, he has a show called Ride with Norman Reedus. So you can see me in action on a bike with Norman if you go to season two, episode four <clears throat> of Ride with Norman Reedus on AMC. Please do that. <laughs> I got this whole little lecture that's about my life in motor with motorcycles, how deeply embedded they are, what they mean to me. I'm not going to get into that. And because, you know, if my wife were here, she'd say, that again? I had a big crash a year ago, 17 fractures, top to bottom. Hips, legs, feet, spine, collarbone, ribs. And I'm OK now. I'm ready again. And she said, OK, Antoine, enough is enough, man. Divorce or bikes? What's the deal? And I, and we, and I said, oh, OK, I don't, want to, I don't want divorce. Come on, I don't want that. Don't start there. And so we negotiated. Now, when you're an architect, you're a master negotiator. They could also call them bullshitter, you know, <laughs> the same thing. And uh, we negotiated, and now I can take mountain rides that aren't, don't involve. I was commuting in LA when I got hit. I got T-boned by a car on Olympic Boulevard in LA. So that got straightened out, and I'm still riding. I'm good, for what it's worth. The power of negotiation. That's why I want to end on that. Be a negotiator, but above all, like, we are artists. We're not, we're not like, <clears throat> mechanics. Mechanics are good. If you have Ducatis, you really need them. Um, if we're, we're artists, that's how we work. We're poetic. We, we, we have poetic encounters with people, with sites, clients. And we take those poetic encounters and we turn them into stuff. It's magic. I mean, you know, this is heroic, the kind of stuff we do, I think. It's totally badass. I mean, how, how often do people in their lives get to do that? And get to impact many other lives that way. So it's a big deal. So let me end on that. You're artists, physical slash digital, digital though. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Nice